Welcome to Stratford Literary Festival. My name is Claire Clark. I am a novelist and reviewer and we were incredibly disappointed to have to cancel this spring's festival for obvious reasons. Um, but as we all acclimatised to a new world of everything online, we didn't see why the pandemic should keep us from bringing what are frankly some sensational events straight to you. So welcome to Stratford Goes Virtual. I'm delighted to introduce David Barry. David, hello. Hello, Claire. And David is, of course, the author of Incredible Journeys, um, a deep dive, and yes, the pun is intentional, into the wonderful world of animal navigation. Um, Sunday Times uh, made it their nature book of the year last year. The New York Times called it delightful and eye-opening book, and so it is. Um, David, First and most importantly, how are you surviving lockdown? Well, so far so good. Uh, it's kind of uh, monotonous, <laughs> uh, but I'm uh, I'm getting lots of useful things done, like uh, trying to polish up my Italian. Oh, excellent! Yeah, I've been very ashamed by my Italian, and the more I learn, the more I realise I should be ashamed <laughs> because I've plainly been making a lot of mistakes over the years. But not ready to conduct this interview in Italian quite yet. Not. <laughs> well, that's great because I wouldn't be able to do it either. Um, David, um, what I wanted to um, start with is obviously um, there's a great deal of the science of animal navigation in your book. Um, I think you're not a scientist by training, but you are a navigator. Well, as a matter of fact, I mean, in a very modest way, I did my first degree was in experimental psychology mm. and philosophy. So yeah, I, I did have some basic scientific training. And in fact, it was when I was studying experimental psychology way back that I first encountered uh, the work of uh, scientists studying animal navigation. And in particular, the great uh, Austrian scientist, Karl von Frisch, mm. who famously discovered the honeybee dance that enables honeybees to share information with their nest mates about the location of food sources which was a truly staggering revelation when it was first announced and that was that was um relatively recently wasn't it well in the middle years of the 20th century i mean mm. it, it, he kind of um it was a gradual process uh, over i mean he made his first discoveries in the 1920s and then it was in the 1950s that the the whole story finally emerged it was a life work Mm. And you, um, I think in your book, you talk a bit about having been a butterfly collector yourself as a boy. So insects were something you were already fascinated by. I am um, besotted by insects. I, I fear the book may sort of uh, reveal that. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, was, I was always interested in, you know, in the natural world. I was lucky. I was brought up in the New Forest and I had a wonderful teacher who gets a, a name check in the book, Mr. Stedman, who was a, who was a, a really professional lepidopterist. And he ran this moth trap uh, at our school. And I got really, really interested in, particularly in moths. Uh, and this, um, this is part of the origin of, of this book, I think. Um, in fact, I was, going to, um, I was going to ask you if that was where your fascination started, because there are so many animal stories in this book, from the very largest to the tiniest animals. Um, it was, so insects is where this, where this sort of um, fascination, where this book began. Well, insects are part of the story. I mean, the other part of the story you, you referred to earlier, which is that I'm a sailor. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. I was brought up in a sailing family and... Um, amazing opportunities which I don't think I fully appreciated at the time uh, including uh, a really life-changing experience when I was 19 when a, a wonderful retired naval officer invited me to help him sail his 34-foot yacht back across the Atlantic and in those days this is 1973 uh, the only way you could uh, reliably navigate a, a small vessel on the open ocean was by using the traditional tools of the sextant and chronometer and he taught me how to how to do that and it was it was it was revelatory I, I, I was so excited and I remain to this day uh, humbled and astonished by the fact that you can fix your position on the surface of this planet 
by observing the light from heavenly bodies that are unimaginably distant. And how and difficult all... was it to learn well, to they... use the sextant? Because it comes into some of the issues about what these animals are, are yeah. um, confronting as they make these enormous journeys. Well, it's, it's both easy and difficult. Um, the easy part is, is learning to fix your, to, to, to determine your latitude, how far north or south you are. I could teach you how to do that in five or 10 minutes. Uh, the longitude part, the east-west part, is a bit more complicated, though the principle is, is quite simple. Um, I won't try and go into it now, but, um, but of course it took a very long time for human beings to find a solution to it. In fact, there were two solutions. There's a widely uh, held misconception that it was all down to Harrison and his chronometer. That isn't actually strictly true. It took a very, very long time before chronometers were accurate enough and cheap enough for uh, sailors to rely on them. I mean, it was something like 70 or 80 years before that was the case. Mm. And in fact, there was an absolutely magical celestial method of determining your longitude, which was called lunar distances. And uh, that, that has always fascinated me. And that was entirely based on mathematics and astronomy. There was no mechanical dimension to that, except for the sextant itself, which was the instrument that you had to use. It's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Because humans have, um, as you very clearly and vividly express in your book, you know, dealt with making enormous journeys with huge risks to life. And yet animals have been making these journeys, much larger journeys for a time immemorial. And you do... Um, write very vividly about some of the some of the incredible um, feats of navigation. Um, I wondered um, if you could talk a bit about it. I, what I was I was so interested by the fact that it wasn't just the whales and the birds who are making these huge migrations. It was also very simple organisms. And I loved your example of the slime mold, <laughs> um, the oat flake experiment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, slime molds are, are quite simple organisms and uh, there's, a, there's a, a famous experiment in which people laid out oat cakes in a pattern that matched the distribution of cities around Tokyo and they then allowed the slime mold to explore these different uh, sources of nourishment and what the slime molds do is to build something rather like tunnels that connect the sources of nourishment with their kind of home base and over time, uh, they strengthen the connections with the best sources and weaken the other ones. And what the scientists found was that eventually the slime molds built a network that exactly matched the railway system around Tokyo because they had basically solved the same problem of passenger management as the Japan Railways management. Uh, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. These are single-cell organisms, presumably. Yes, no. yes. It's yeah. absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, there are some extraordinary feats that you talk about. You talk about um, the Clark's nutcracker hiding seeds in quite unimaginable numbers of places and being able to go back and, and find them. Um, which of the stories um, are the ones that you most, that you come back to again and again and can't really believe? Well, the Clark's nut Nutcracker is uh, very impressive. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a, a member of the Crow family that lives in the Rocky Mountains of North America. And uh, it hides nuts <laughs> uh, to enable it to get through the very harsh winters. And it does this over vast areas. I mean, maybe a hundred square miles of mountainside uh, and in thousands of different tiny um, caches. Uh, so maybe you know, just six or seven nuts in each one. And yet, uh, when the time comes and it needs to, to find them, it can go back and find all of these scattered caches over such a large area. It is an astonishing thing. Mm. I mean, we couldn't possibly do it. <laughs> no, and, and a much smaller brain, technically, than, than the human brain. Well, it is a small brain, but uh, they are very smart. Mm. Um, and... Um, yeah, I mean, the crow family is, uh, I mean, they're very, very smart birds. Um, I mean, some of, the, I, I was very interested too by your um, 
uh, stories of migration. I mean, we're, we're sort of accustomed to the ideas of bird migration. I know that um, for a long time, people couldn't explain, humans couldn't explain that either. But you're, you talk about insect migrations that are thousands of kilometers um, around the world uh, on an annual basis, don't you? I mean, there, and yeah. there, are, there are numerous examples of that in your yes. book. Well, I mean, animal migration is, is a whole subject in itself. And obviously navigation is part of the story of migration. Mm. Um, and birds are famous migrants. But insects, yes. Uh, the monarch butterfly in North America is probably the most famous insect migrant. Uh, but one of the discoveries I made in researching the book is that there's a dragonfly that does something, if anything, even more impressive. It actually migrates across the Indian Ocean, from India to East Africa, via the Maldives. And then it returns uh, later, or its offspring return. Um, and this is truly astonishing, because for an insect to fly over thousands of kilometers of open ocean uh, is, well, remarkable. Mm. And I mean, that is, that is one, of the, um, one of the stories in your book, and it's very interesting how many of them you know, people have been working a great deal on a number of the stories and the animals that you uh, refer to in your book, but um, lots of them remain mysterious, don't they? The, the manners in which these animals do in fact navigate and how they make their way to the same place again and again, and often very, very small targets, often very, yes. you know, they're traveling thousands and thousands of kilometers to reach something as a sort of a speck in the ocean, like Ascension Island, for example. Yes, yes, no, exactly so. No, I think in truth, I mean, the, the science of animal, animal navigation is more mysteries than solutions. I mean, mm. uh, astonishing discoveries have been made and great progress is, is, is being made all the time. But uh, there are many things that remain profoundly mysterious. And particularly some of these great transoceanic migrations. You mentioned Ascension Island. Well, the, the, the green turtles from the coast of Brazil go to Ascension Island to breed. And this is a, a huge journey across the South Atlantic. And they have to locate what is really a tiny target, an island that's just a few kilometers wide, thousands of kilometers out from the coast. And yet they do it year mm. after year after year. And exactly how they do it is mysterious. We know that marine turtles uh, seem to have this very highly developed magnetic sense. Uh, we also suspect that they use their sense of smell and taste, uh, but there may well be other factors of which we're completely unaware. And, and I don't think anybody yet can offer a completely satisfactory explanation for how they do that particular thing. Well, one of the most lovely things about your book, I think, is not just the extraordinary stories of the animals, but also the extraordinary stories of the scientists who are devoted to finding out about how these animals do navigate, how they do find their way. Um, and there are some extremely um, sort of um, eccentric, almost, experiments, aren't there? I mean, people have done incredible, astonishing things. And I was thinking about um, the desert ants, particularly ah, the story yes. of the desert ants in Tunisia. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I, I should just interject that one of my main purposes in writing the book was actually to shed some light on the scientific process itself. Mm. I didn't just want it to be a whole lot of gee whiz revelations. I wanted mm. people to get some sense of how these discoveries are made and also some sense of the extraordinary devotion and ingenuity and sheer grit and determination that these scientists often display. And Rudiger Weiner, whom I interviewed for the book, uh, who is really a superstar of animal navigation, he's the sort of Carl von Frisch of our time, he has spent 50 years with his colleagues working on ant navigation. And he discovered that the desert ant of, of North Africa had this really amazingly elaborate toolkit uh, which consists of, of a whole host of different uh, navigational mechanisms. And the, the, the remarkable thing about the desert ant is that it lives in these very, very forbidding, bleak, um, featureless salt pans, broilingly hot. And its nest 
is under the ground to avoid the heat, obviously, and the entrance to the nest is just a tiny hole big enough to let the ants come in and go out. The desert ants go out foraging for dead insects, and they may wander for hundreds of meters outside their nest. And what people first noticed 100 or more years ago was something extraordinary. They would find a dead butterfly, pick it up in their jaws, and then they would head straight back for the little tiny nest entrance, which would be completely invisible to them. How on earth could they do that? Well, to cut a long story short, you have to read Incredible Journeys to get the, <laughs> the details, but to cut a long story short, they have, they have a sun compass built into them so they can maintain a steady course even though the sun is constantly moving across the sky. And that's based on their ability to, to detect patterns of polarized light. In addition to that, they have an odometer. They can actually measure how far they've gone by effectively by counting their steps. And, and tell, and about, the more, experiment, tell about the experiment that um, they did uh, yes. to, to well, discover it's, it's, the odometer, because that's a wonderful story. It is, it's a slightly drastic story, and as an insect lover, it pains me in a way to tell it, but, but not very long ago, one of um, Rudiger Weiner's colleagues called Marcus Wittlinger uh, conducted an experiment in which he, he shortened the legs of some ants by literally just cutting them off short, um, and lengthened the legs of other ants with bits of pig bristle. And what this revealed was that the the, the ants with the shortened legs, when they were released at, at a distance from their nest, uh, would, would stop short on their way back because they overestimated how far they'd gone because their legs had been shortened and their strides were therefore shorter. Whereas the opposite happened with the lengthened, the stilt walking ants, if you like. They overshot. Um, so this was a beautiful, um, simple demonstration of the ability of the desert ant to measure its the distance it's covered using mm. its strides which is a, an astonishing feat I, I thought one of the really interesting things too was how much scientists have learnt from times when the navigation systems go wrong so under trying to understand why either human interventions concord is one of the ones that comes up in your book or weather or have affected or you know cloudy nights or whatever that they have been they've undertaken experiments where they've thought they've understood it and then something goes wrong or something in their control changes and you understand that actually there must be other systems going on in yes, order exactly. for the, the navigation to continue unimpeded no that's absolutely right it's uh, i mean one of the great challenges of this kind of science is just working out exactly what the animals are capable of doing. Uh, I joined uh, an Australian scientist called Eric Warrant uh, in Australia to take part in some really amazing experiments high up in the snowy mountains of New South Wales in the middle of the night to explore how a migratory moth with the wonderful name of the Bogong, how that navigates over long distances. It's a migratory moth that travels uh, more than a thousand kilometers. Um, and it flies by night. And Eric and his colleagues had great difficulty in making their experiment work because basically they underestimated how much these moths could see. It's all explained in the book, but they eventually realized that, that, the, that the, the apparatus they'd made was completely useless because the moths could see all kinds of stuff that they couldn't see and they had to improve it. And eventually the experiment was a success and they were able to, to demonstrate that the Bogong moth um, has a magnetic compass that it steers by. And later, uh, they were also able to reveal that it uses the Milky Way as well. Like the I mean, dung, just, and the dung beetles too, didn't they? There was the an beetle. amazing experiment with dung beetles with little hats, which was That's just... <laughs> exactly right. Well, that's, that, that was Eric Warren and his colleague Marie Dacker. Um, and that was quite a funny story because they first discovered that nocturnal dung beetles used the light of the moon 
to steer a straight course. And then a few years later, they were sitting out in the desert, uh, waiting to start a, a new experiment, and the moon hadn't risen. But dung beetles started flying in, and they started making balls of dung and rolling them away in a straight line. And Eric and Marie were really quite perturbed because according to their theory, it shouldn't have been possible. There was no moon. Mm. So they were, they were a bit alarmed. They thought they might have to retract their earlier uh, report. And then they looked up at the beautifully dark night sky and saw the band of the, the Milky Way. And they looked at each other and said, is it possible they could be using the Milky Way? And yeah, then they did these wonderful experiments where they put little cardboard hats on the, the beetles to prevent them seeing the Milky Way. And they went all over the place. Mm. And then they put little transparent hats on them um, and they were able to go straight again, which showed it wasn't the hat that was upsetting them. And then they did experiments in a planetarium where they altered the orientation of the Milky Way. And sure enough, that was, that was it. The dung beetles were steering by the Milky Way as the bogong moths later mm. turned out to be doing as well. It's quite likely that lots of insects do this. I mean, we're just at the beginning yeah. of this process of discovery. Well, I think uh, one of the really, one of the things you explain so brilliantly in the book is how complicated it is. So how animals use different sorts of navigation at different times and therefore our, our desire to find an explanation is complicated by the fact that there isn't an explanation. There yes. are multiple explanations in almost every situation. Exactly. And I think this is particularly problematical with birds. I mean, a, a huge amount of research has been done on bird navigation over the last hundred years or more. Uh, and yet there are still many mysteries. I mean, we, we know that, for example, nocturnal migrant birds have this extraordinary ability to detect where true north is mm. by looking at the patterns of rotation among the stars over the North Pole. They don't look for the North Star the way we would, they just look for this pattern of rotation. Um, but we also know that many of them have a magnetic compass sense. We know that day flying birds, like the desert ant, can use the sun to steer by. Uh, we also know that some of them seem to use their sense of smell. Mm. And there's a big debate that continues to this day, quite a heated debate actually, about how homing pigeons perform the truly astonishing feat of finding their way home when they're taken to a place maybe 300 kilometers away that they've never visited before and released. How on earth could they find their way home when they don't know where they are and have no idea how they got there? Mm. Well, they can do it um, more often than not. And one theory, which has quite a lot of support, is that they basically orient in a homeward direction by using their sense of smell. Now, when you pause to think about that, it, it sounds preposterous. And indeed, the scientist, um, the Italian scientist who first made this discovery, found it hard to believe himself. But over 40 years, many, many experiments have been done which do seem to bear this theory out, but they're not, it's not totally accepted. And there is this other theory, which needn't necessarily be in competition with it, but there's a separate theory that's been championed by a lone voice scientist in America called John Hagstrom, whom I also interviewed for the book. And John believes that homing pigeons may actually be relying on um, infrasound, very, very low frequency sound, to find their way home from these great distances. And I think you mentioned earlier the uh, his discovery about Concord. Mm. Uh, it was, I, I mean, this is not, this is circumstantial evidence in support of his theory, but it's, it's entertaining. He found that homing pigeons in races uh, found, had great difficulty in getting home when their journeys coincided with the passage nearby of the Concord supersonic airliner. And his theory was that it was the, the shock wave the, the infrasonic shockwave from the airliner that was disturbing their navigation system. And he found there was one occasion when a, a race had been uh, smashed, as it's called, 
and he, he looked to see whether Concorde had flown by at the appropriate time, and it hadn't. So he thought, oh dear, well, my theory is ruined. And then he rang the Air France office and spoke to somebody there. And he said, look, I'm a scientist. It, could you just tell me, on this particular day, was Concorde delayed by two hours? And the Frenchman on the other end apparently just said, Doc, that is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, the mighty Concorde is never delayed. But he said, no, no, look, really, you know, this is important. I, I need to check. Please, would you check? So reluctantly, the guy checked. And two hours later, he phoned back and said, are you a magician? Because sure enough, the plane had been delayed by two hours, so it, it fit. Anyway, we don't know. Mm. But I think it's an intriguing possibility that infrasound may be part of the navigational system of the homing pigeon. And I love the fact, too, that um, you said that homing pigeons are a bit like commuters, in that when they get really close to home, they actually don't follow the most sensible route at all, necessarily. They go the route they know the best, because people yeah. just have habitual behaviours, even when they have these amazing systems. No, that's absolutely right. And, and I mean, the interesting thing about the homing pigeons is that they've got, definitely, they have multiple navigational systems, and they switch between them. Mm. Um, and yes, they're creatures of habit. You know, they, they will, if they've discovered that you know, they can follow a railway line and then when they get to the bridge, they take the road and when they get to the roundabout, they take the first left. They'll do that <laughs> again and again and again. Uh, it's quite charming. Um, you've talked, David, a little bit about um, when we were talking about the odometer and the desert ants about having some misgivings. Sometimes, and you talk a little bit about that um, throughout the book, about how um, we can moderate or intervene in these animals behaviors and how far it is legitimate to go in order to pursue our understanding of how it works has has writing the book clarified your mind about that or has it just left you with more as many questions as you started with i think it's i think it's a i think it's a really difficult issue actually um, and what's made it much harder is the revelation over the last 30 40 years or so that many, many animals that were previously thought to be not even really sentient uh, are much, much more richly aware of what's going on than we hitherto realized, much more intelligent. There are issues about levels of consciousness, um, the ability to feel pain. I, I mean, you know, for a long, long time, it was comfortably assumed that lots of animals like crustaceans and so forth probably didn't feel pain. But I'm afraid the evidence uh, now is stacking up that that is, that is simply false. Mm. So I think it has profound implications for the ethics of animal experimentation. And I, I have to say, I mean, I talked to a lot of the scientists about this and, and most of them um, very much shared these concerns. And, and I would say that everybody I interviewed uh, was scrupulous about avoiding uh, inflicting any unnecessary suffering or indeed any suffering if possible mm. on their subjects but i think the ethics of of uh, animal uh, experimental use that's a big complicated uh, subject um, and maybe one for another book <laughs> <laughs> and i mean one of the things that's been interesting during lockdown i think is how much um, natural life has returned to um, urban spaces particularly and how you know there's been a great deal of information about turtles having more successful nesting um, seasons because the beaches are deserted I mean do you think that this um, that the change is forced on human behavior by the pandemic will um, allow us to step back and see our place in the ecosystem a bit more moderately a bit more clearly that would be wonderful Mm. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a sort of um, I'm an optimist by nature, and I, I I really do hope that this hideous pandemic will turn out to be an opportunity to reassess a lot of things, and that might well be one of them. Uh, I mean, I, there, 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 almost every scientist I spoke to uh, talked about the problems of uh, loss of biodiversity, the problems of uh, pollution the problems of, well, all, you know, climate change. I mean, I mean the, the, we're surrounded by natural wonders that are being threatened by our activities. I mean, this is a truism, uh, but it's 
it, and also a depressing fact that we seem to find it astonishingly difficult to muster the political resolve mm. actually to address these issues. And maybe, maybe the COVID pandemic will prove to be an effective wake up call. Let's hope so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one, one, I think, well, unfortunately, we are probably getting to the end of our time. But one last question I wanted to ask you about. Um, you talk in your book about um, the fact that obviously, you know, some of the stories you tell are about human navigation um, and, um, and some astonishing feats of, of navigation among people like the Inuit, uh, who are still reliant on navigation without, without instruments. Um, oh. and, on the loss that GPS and these sorts of technical things have brought. Um, do you worry about that, what that will do to our ability to interact with our environment in a way that takes proper account of it? Yes, I do, I do. GPS is a technological marvel, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, it's astonishing, and it's really one of the most impressive achievements of the last 50 years or so, uh, but it has had a very profound effect on us. I mean, it's, it's widespread adoption over the last 20 years or so, um, represents the most profound revolution in navigation in the history of our species. Um, and one of the consequences of GPS is that it's relieved us of the need to pay any attention to our surroundings. Mm. I mean, it's now possible to work out exactly where you are at the press of a button just by looking at a little glowing screen. And um, obviously that, you know, that's very convenient uh, and, you know, sometimes it contributes to greater safety and so forth. But it also has, I think, had a profound impact on our relationship with the natural world. I mean, we are, we have been gradually, as a result of successive technological innovations, we have been gradually distancing ourselves more and more from the world around us. And I think the GPS revolution is, it may not be the last stage in that process, but it's really one of the most profound steps in it. Um, I mean, we have been, as a species, reliant on our ability to find our way around by observing our surroundings by looking at the sun and the stars, by recognizing landmarks and learning routes. I mean, you know, that goes back into the indefinite past. We're talking hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary history. And suddenly we no longer have to do that. Mm. And we know that the parts of the brain that enable us to navigate using those old techniques tend to shrink when they're not exercised. And we also know that those parts of the brain that support our ability to navigate also support our ability to do a lot of other things that are very, very important to us. So I think there is a worry that if we don't exercise our navigational skills, we may lose parts of the brain or we may see shrinkage in parts of the brain that that perform functions that are extremely important to us. So there's a set of issues there that, uh, well, we're gonna discover from experience how serious that is. But the most important point for me has to do with this, um, this distancing from the natural world. I do very much fear that as we become more and more heavily reliant on technology, we will pay quite a heavy price in terms of our sense of belonging. Mm. Um, and that by losing contact with the natural world, we will actually become profoundly impoverished. And the implications of that, both for our health and for our spiritual well being, I think may well turn out to be profound. Mm. Well, I, I think very um, sadly, I think we're going to have to start to, well, we're going to have to bring this conversation to a close. But I have to say that in terms of making people understand the value of the natural world and really inspiring awe, both in the creatures performing these extraordinary navigational feats and in the 
men and women who are looking into them and trying to understand them. This book, uh, Incredible Journeys of yours, David, is just sensational. Um, and for those of you who want to know more, uh, you can, uh, there is a link on the Festival's Goes virtual page for ordering the book. Um, and there'll also be other interviews with other people available on the page. Um, it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to you, David. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And thank you to everyone for watching. And we will see you all at our winter festival and stay safe. Thanks very much. Goodbye.